Welcome back to The Heat. We just heard from former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright about U.S.-China relations. And joining us now from Beijing is Yang Shi Yu. He is a senior fellow at the China Institute of International Studies and served as the founding director of the Office on Korean Peninsula Issues with the Chinese Foreign Ministry. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. We just heard from the U.S. Secretary of State about her time in office, but relations between the U.S. and China have moved on. We had the historic 2013 Sunnyland Summit between President Xi and Obama. Mapping out a new model of major power relations. How is that going, sir? Well, uh, since the uh, Sunnyland uh, uh, Summit, the bilateral relation goes through a up and down, a rocky road. Mm. Uh, some, uh, some parts uh, are positive, but also some uh, negative. Uh, simply because of the closer ties between the two great powers, the more uh, differences uh, are appeared. Uh, but in, uh, 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 in general, both the positive and the negative developments uh, are going on in the bilateral relation. Uh, I think that's uh, quite normal. Basically, the direction remains towards the new type of the uh, uh, new type of the uh, relationship between the establishing power and the rising power, simply because of the top level between the two countries has determined to go through the bilateral relation in no, conf no confrontational manner uh, and uh, cooperate uh, cooperation manner. That is the base for the bilateral relation. One of the strongest aspects of the relationship, of course, trade, now over $550 billion between the two. But there are still problems here about growing it. For example, the bilateral investment treaty seems to be slow in coming. Uh, what about progress there and trade going forward? Yeah, well, uh, you, you're touching one of the most exciting uh, items in the bilateral relation, but also for the international economy uh, as a whole, BIT, Bilateral uh, Investment Treaty. Um, uh, the, the treaty will be negotiated and, uh, and uh, done by the largest, the two largest economies. That will not only lay a base for the two largest economies' trade investment, but also uh, that will set a very good model uh, for the world, for the region as a whole. But uh, the, uh, besides the BIT, the bilateral trade uh, grow very fast, uh, not only because of the comparative advantages between the two countries, but also because uh, the trade has been driving, uh, has been driven by both trade and investment. During the past, only the one-way investment uh, and the two-way trade. One-way investment is uh, American capital into the China, but now the, the two-way investment, the dual investment, uh, Mutual investments are fast growing uh, with uh, steady growth of the inv American investment, but the fast growth of the Chinese investment going to U.S. Uh, such a mutual investment uh, uh, provides uh, one more powerful uh, driver uh, for the fast growing uh, bilateral trade. One other area of cooperation, sir, is obviously on climate change. Both countries made a historic announcement ahead of the Paris Climate Agreement talks uh, to cut emissions uh, and also slow the growth of emissions. Is this somewhere where Beijing and Washington are leading the world? Yes, absolutely. As the largest, as the two largest economy, and as well the largest uh, two, uh, the two largest. Uh, um, uh, emission uh, makers, mm. China and the U.S. take uh, the largest responsibility for the climate change. Fortunately, the two presidents made a uh, consensus uh, during uh, Obama's visit in Beijing that, that uh, contributed greatly to the success of the Paris Conference. Just uh, compared with the Copenhagen Conference and the Paris Conference, the, the former were failed because the largest two uh, didn't uh, cooperation, mm. didn't go cooperation. Uh, but this time we are successful because our two countries make a very good, very good cooperation. And uh, through the la uh, latest uh, SNED uh, uh, strategic and economic dialogues in Beijing, the two sides determined to strengthen further the cooperation on the climate change to implement the Paris Treaty that will contribute uh, greatly to the uh, global 
climate change challenge. Well, that's a positive, but on the negative side, we just heard from uh, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, who said that the US was actually an Asian power and had every right to enforce what it calls freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. Now, this is an area where Washington and Beijing seem to be disagreeing more and more. What can be done? Yeah, uh, the issue you mentioned is one of the negative driver contributed negatively to the bilateral relation. Uh, on the difference on South China Sea between China and the U.S. does not lies in the right of the freedom of the passage, but the format and the approach to deal with the stability and the peace in this region. China's logic is to maintain the peace and stability on South China Sea, to solve the differences, uh, controversial issues on the uh, rights and the island uh, disputes among the related partners. The issue should be dealt with by China and ASEAN, and by China and uh, the other claimants. Mm. But the U.S. position is U.S. should be involved. That triggers the differences between China and the U.S., even though I, I should point out that uh, uh, on, the, on the basis of the freedom of the passages, China and the U.S. share the same position, share the same goal. And, uh, but uh, we have a different principle from the United States. If, uh, according to U.S. principle, say, U.S. have a right to uh, navigation uh, even into the 12 uh, miles uh, in the world, in the uh, clo very close uh, water. Yeah. But the question is whether or not the other powers of Navy should go into Japanese, uh, uh, Japan Sea, or the other sea, if uh, there are some uh, disputes there. So basically, China's principle is very simple. The differences, the issues and the problems in this region should be dealt with and solved by the players surrounding this area. So that is our basic position. Now, obviously, you're very close to negotiations with the DPRK. And U.S. Secretary of State, former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, went there 16 years ago when Kim Jong-il, the father of Kim Jong-un, who is now in power, uh, was serving. Since then, we have seen uh, a rapid development of DPRK's missile technology, more nuclear testing, more sanctions as well. Uh, where does this stand and where can the China and the U.S. work together while preserving national interests? Well, uh, cooperation, uh, China-U.S. cooperation on Korean Peninsula is a positive part. Uh, I'm very glad uh, that uh, I, I was involved in such a positive part. Basically, China-U.S. remain uh, sharing the very same position on the denuclearization. Neither China nor uh, U.S will allow, will accept North Korea's nuclearization, although the new leader in Pyongyang has determined to uh, make their country as the so-called nuclear state. Uh, recently, just, uh, uh, just uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a very track two discussions among the six delegations, including uh, U.S. Ambassador Kim and the uh, uh, North Korean uh, senior official from the foreign ministry and the Chinese ambassador Wu Dawei, and I took part in that uh, track two dialogues. We, ha uh, U.S. and China, shared the same position, uh, but uh, we have felt that North Korean uh, delegation really sent a very sophisticated uh, uh, signals towards in, uh, towarding the possible returning to the negotiation for the denuclearization. I think with, uh, if we have a proper uh, approach between China and the U.S. and other parties, I believe and I'm confident that uh, uh, we can uh, bring about the denuclearization under the current pressures and uh, corporations, uh, although we need to go a long way. Uh, it's interesting that you obviously are pushing towards a resumption of the six-party talks because that's exactly what uh, 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 former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright was hinting at as well. But we have U.S. elections uh, coming up, and there's been some eyebrows raised in China about both major candidates, uh, potentially a President Donald Trump or a Hillary Clinton, who was the architect of the rebalance to Asia. What are your thoughts? Firstly, I think... 
uh, I don't think there will be substantive differences between uh, Hillary Clinton or uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, if both of them are really responsible for American national interests, uh, any uh, president from any party uh, will try to stabilize, try to seek for a stable U.S.-China relation, no matter she or he hate or like China. That's for, uh, uh, that, 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 that's uh, one point. The other point is, I really feel uh, some differences between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Uh, in short, if Hillary Clinton uh, take the presidency, I expect the U.S. government will strengthen the existing strategy of the so-called rebalance. That will trigger more differences between China and the U.S., but also provide more opportunities uh, for cooperation between U.S. and China either. Uh, if uh, Mr. Trump uh, wins the presidency, uh, I'm afraid he will go a, a sort of a Nile isol isolationism in, uh, in your foreign policy. That will be uh, different from Hillary Clinton's style. Maybe U.S. will uh, strengthen their allies in Asia Pacific to take their uh, to ask their ally uh, friends to take uh, more responsibilities, especially on Japan. If that is the case, I think uh, Japan, U.S., China triangle relation will be mm. more complicated and uh, uh, input uh, uh, input more uh, uncertainties uh, in future.